Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're sitting here watching our Takeo Tuesday. Welcome, welcome, welcome for joining us again uh, for another fabulous Takeo Tuesday class. Uh, glad you're all here joining us today. Um, greatly appreciate you jumping in and joining early. Let's uh, make sure I get my screen up and running here. All righty, there we go and we are up and running so good to see you all and today's session we have our residential focus on july 26th and 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 today we're going to talk about why dhw recirculation systems uh and what's going on with those things today uh, so that is today's class uh again thank you for joining us for take uh tuesday classes uh uh noon eastern time here and uh, uh let's just get a couple things started right away and i see a bunch of people still logging in so that's fine so let's get started. So if you have never been to a GoToWebinar before, what I want you to do is take a look at the control panel. Hey, wait a minute, don't go that fast, okay? Um, and if you see that orange arrow pointing to the left, what I'd like you to do is click it and so it expands to the right and you'll have your expanded control panel so you can see the speakers to make sure that you can hear me. If we have any handouts, we will have some handouts listed there. Uh, and in order to communicate with us, uh, well, actually, it's just going to be me today. John is out uh, this week and Rick is out working. So John uh, is taking a couple of days out. Uh, it's his birthday week, so to speak. Uh, I think it was on Sunday was his birthday. So we took a half the week off and to uh, to celebrate his birthday. So uh, I will be monitoring all the questions uh, here and any comments coming through and any answers uh, is in the questions chat section area. Uh, and make sure when you type it in, uh, that you hit the send button. Plenty of people type things in there and forget to hit the send. Um, so if you could all that are there with me to make sure that you can one, see, and two, hear, of course, do a quick hi, hello, how are you, if you can. So this way we know that uh, everything is working. And I see Kerry and Eric, awesome. Jerry and David, awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, and I will do this periodically. I will also stop and review the questions as they come through. Uh, and I will inter I will uh, interrupt myself, so to speak, as we go through the class. And I may also ask some simple, easy questions out there. Um, and if you know the answer, type it in there, and that just goes to confirm that we still have an internet connection. Um, so it was a little spotty here yesterday, here on the Isle of Long in New York. Uh, we had some storms whipping through, and I was in the middle of a couple of meetings, and uh, things started getting dicey. So I just wanna make sure uh, that we always will have that connection and I'm not just talking to myself. So I have done webinars before where all of a sudden my uh, phone is lighting up as I'm getting text messages, hey Dave, we lost you. So anyways, so this is what it looks like on the computer. If you are on a phone or tablet, things will look a little bit differently. Um, so on that phone or tablet, you'll uh, be able, to, you'll have to toggle between the camera and the presentation, all right? And you'll do that on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. Uh, your audio settings will be next and then you will have the questions or ask uh questions you know, the question mark uh where you can answer or ask questions there and you'll have to toggle between each one of them as you go through so um with that being said all right uh in case you haven't found us on social media we're all over the place and this is just a couple of samplings of them uh, on what we've got going on out there um l l plenty of plenty of places out there obviously take out tuesdays are recorded uh and put up on our youtube page so if you ever wanted to go back and take a look at what was out there and what we've done in the past uh you'll see that qr code on the left hand side of your screen uh, if you want to find us on Facebook, actually, nope, I'm sorry, I got those reversed. The YouTube, uh, the Facebook is the one on the left. The one on the right is our YouTube page for all the Takeo Tuesdays uh, that are recorded out there and set up there. So, uh, but take a look and, and come check us out uh, all over the place on social media, obviously LinkedIn also, uh, where we have quite a book, Facebook, Instagram, um, you name it, we're, we're, we've got a page out there for it. So, Let's talk about domestic hot water recirculation and why do we need to do it and what's going on with it. All right. So um, it's a very, very common issue that people run into, uh, meaning having to wait for hot water uh, in their homes. So um, what I like to talk about is just show the plumbing 
how the plumbing is done in your home. And we typically install plumbing as a trunk and branch style system, meaning that we'll send down the center of our basement, all right, and then we'll tee off and go to our different fixture groups. And typically our fixture groups are around the outside walls of the home itself. So you've got a little bit of distance. And why cold water is because you've got this length of pipe. When we heat it up, we send hot water down it. And if it's not being drawn off of, uh, the water starts to cool down. And as it starts to cool down, all right, that's when we start to you know have to start to wait for it. And what we need to do now is dump all of this water that is in this pipe that has reached room temperature and replace it with warm water coming out of our water heater again. All right, so this is what we need to wait for. This is what's going on when we think about it. And of course, the larger the home, the worse it gets. The bigger the pipe, the worse it gets. Um, but it hasn't always been that way. We haven't always had to wait for hot water, right? So I like to throw up a quick little definition to really think about what domestic hot water recirculation is. All right, it's a plumbing system that replaces the hot water to fixtures without draining and wasting the water. A recirculation system mechanically moves temperature from the water heater to the fixtures. All right, and that's important to think about. We don't need to move a serious amount of hot water in a residential setting. We need to just trickle the temperature or trickle the water through, and we're really just pumping temperature. So uh, this week's class, we're not going to get into designing, all right, and selection and stuff like that. That will be in two weeks' time. Uh, where we get into designing and selection, all right? This week is just defining what hot water recirculation is and the different ways that we can install a hot water research system, all right, and control it today. So, but remember that we don't have to move serious amounts of water when it comes to a hot water research system, all right? It is a low volume of water. All we need to do is replace the water that was in those pipes with warm water behind it, all right, without wasting it. So, like I said before, why are things different? Why do we, and I, I got a quick poll for everybody out there. All right, quick question, residentially, what do you think across the North America, the percentage of homes that have a hot water recirculation system installed? What do you think that percentage is? All right, <clears throat> and I will wait for a couple of numbers to come in. I, all right, I see a couple, five, 10, one, two, 10, 15, half a percent. All right. All right. We got a couple of numbers coming in there. Excellent. Thank you very much. We're looking at about 3%. 3% of homes out there have a hot water research system. Now, where you are in the country, things might be different. All right. We're starting to see a lot of codes come into play discussing hot water recirculation. So we're not wasting that water. So a lot of new construction and a lot of projects nowadays are requiring a hot water research system installed. Um, but all right, now here's the second half of that question. How many homes need hot water research out there? <laughs> Jerry right away says all of them, yes, right? There's a lot of homes out there that need hot water recirculation out there. You know, there's still a lot of the older homes that don't need it, all right? So Adam, he, he throws in there a 70%, Paul, in your neck of the woods, maybe 50%, right? So it depends on where you are also in the country, okay? And the type of construction where you're at. So let's discuss what's happened, say, over the last 50 years. Let's take a look at home construction. When we think about that home in 1970, the average home size was around 1,500 square feet. Today, we're pushing almost 3,000, all right? That average home size, almost 3,000. And now I want you to think about those homes and when we lived in those homes, okay? So that home in 1970, how many people lived in that home? Right, and how many baths were in that 1970, 1500 square foot home? We're looking at one bath, right? One bath in that house, and how many people lived in that house? More than four. Usually it was five, yeah, there you go, Andrew, right? Five people, one bath. So therefore, one, the water never had a chance to cool down, all right? It was always being used, okay? So we always had some usage going on. You never had a chance for that water to really cool down in that home in 1970. Today's home, almost 3,000 square feet, Okay, we're looking at two and a half, three baths in a house, and no more than four people, right? Meaning we can't have kids outnumber the parents <laughs> any longer, right? So now we have that 
two and a half bath house, much larger, there's a bigger opportunity for that water to cool down in those pipes, right? Because as that house gets bigger, obviously the distance to the furthest fixture has increased. All right, we're looking at almost tripling that distance. You take a look at that home in 1970, and where was the water heater placed? All right, in the basement. All right, right above it was going to be the kitchen, and then sharing a wall was the bathroom. So we didn't have a lot of distance to that first fixture. It was really, really close. All right, so today we're putting fixtures wherever we want. All right, we're going to put a fixture every distance of the house itself. So independent of where the water heater is, we're not paying attention to that. We're just going to put the water heater on one side of the house and we've got to run the pipe all the way out. So you might see around an 80 foot or you could see a heck of a lot more. All right. So now here's an interesting piece of trivia for you in residential home construction. What product or what product invention in the world of plumbing allowed us to start putting fixtures wherever we wanted and getting further away. All right, and Travis brings up plastic plumbing. Which side, Travis? That's the biggest thing, yes. There you go, yes, on the waste side of things, right? As we started introducing ABS and, and, and PVC for waste pipes compared to our cast iron pipes, allowed us to start putting fixtures wherever we wanted to in the house. So, you know, a lot of people start thinking PEX plumbing, PEX pipe, uh, to allow that. Nah, not really. You know, PEX really didn't get started adopted here until the, the 90s uh, for, for residential plumbing systems out there. So, uh, but it's mostly our waste pipes, all right, cast iron, all right? And instead of using cast iron, we switched over to ABS and, and uh, PVC for our waste pipes. So we start introducing further and further distances away for our um, water delivery. And then of course, as the house gets bigger, we have the more opportunities to put more baths and more hot water demand in different parts of the house. So that home in 1970, the fixture count was around six. Obviously today we're doubling that, if not more. All right, so we have a lot more fixtures going on in the house. So for example, uh, in my own house, when I renovated it about eight years ago, I was replumbing. I mean, I gutted the house to the studs and, you know, new radiant heating throughout the whole place and uh, new insulation, new electric, because I had aluminum wiring in the house. And uh, as I am running, uh, replacing the fixture to the front yard uh, in the driveway, I put in a hot cold valve. So everybody that came over, every contractor, every friend, whoever during the construction process would see the red and blue pipe coming down the wall to the outdoor fixture. And they looked at it and said, what's going on there? Why do you have hot water going outside? I turned around and said, because I can, All right? Yes, I've got hot water available at my driveway. And really it just, uh, it amounted to maybe eight feet of PEX tubing. Wasn't much because the overhead line was fed, was feeding a, a bathroom upstairs. So I just teed into it and dropped down some, some half inch PEX. And People looking at me like, well, what do you need hot water in your driveway for? And I said, because I can. You know, if anybody's ever washed their car in November and dunked their hand into an ice cold bucket, you know, that hurts. OK, um, I also had uh, at the time I had a very active lab. Unfortunately, she's uh, not as active any longer as she's getting older. Um, but, you know, used to take her for hikes and, and walks around. And, and if she got into a mud puddle. Oh, yeah. You know, and she wasn't coming into the house just yet. So I would be able to say hose her down out in the driveway. Now, with that being said, I installed that eight years ago. I haven't turned on the hot valve yet. Okay. So, but I have it capable and I have it available to me. So our number of fixture count has gone up tremendously. <clears throat> all right. So what does all that mean? All right. When we start taking a look at all that information, right? So first off, the higher the fixture count, the higher the volume of water, all right? That's a given, all right? That's a given. Um, so with that being said, the more volume of water that we need for our system, the bigger the supply of pipe. Meaning um, when you do your plumbing design in the house and you do your fixture count, your fixture count is gonna warrant what pipe size you need to start coming off the water heater. So we stop and think about that home in 1970 and what size pipe did we have coming off the water heater feeding those two fixtures, basically the kitchen and the bathroom? 
you know, we came off with just half inch pipe and it was, you know, 20 feet tops. Today, min I've never seen, you know, we're never coming off the water heater with half inch any longer. It's starting at three quarter, if not one inch coming off of that water heater today, especially as we're, you know, getting into these uh, number of fixtures that we have in the house. You've got that jacuzzi tub upstairs. Um, so we might be looking at one inch, inch and a quarter pipe feeding throughout the entire house. So you got larger pipe now. All right. Now, as we start thinking about history and start thinking about the last 50 years, things have also changed with those fixtures. And our fixtures um, have a lower flow rate. We start making them a little more efficient. Uh, we put aerators in them now to, to simulate the pressure so we're not wasting as much. When you think about a shower head today, or you go shopping for a shower head today, what's our flow rate coming out of a shower head, all right, with the, with the restrictors that are built in there, right? So today's shower heads, um, you know, very low flow rates, okay? Andrew, yes, your, your, uh, your fixture at the sink is going to be about a half gallon a minute, right? Um, your shower head, all right, we're looking at, you know, two to two and a half gallons a minute today, all right? Two is, uh, is uh, uh, two and a half is code in a lot of parts of the country. Two is coming. You can get some, as Bob says, as low as 1.7 gallons a minute flow rate coming out of there. Now you think about that shower head in 1970, all right? That shower head in 1970 was five, six gallons a minute. And I remember when flow restrictors first started coming out and everybody hated them. And we all learned real quickly how to take that flow restrictor out when you wanted to buy a new shower head. You know, if you were at the at the home improvement store and you bought a new shower head, you looked at it and say, oh, there's that flow restrictor. Let me pop that thing out of there so I can get that high flow rate again that I was used to. All right. So, um, but now obviously we can't get to them anymore. You really have to really destroy the whole thing in order to take that flow restrictor out. So, all right. So we've got big pipe. Now we have a low flow rate coming out of our fixtures, which means the velocity of the water has dropped tremendously. We have a very low velocity of the water. Yes, we need to design that big pipe to handle when every fixture calls at the same time we can supply them. So the velocity ends up dropping. And then we take that re reduced velocity, increase the distance to that furthest fixture, and now the result is that you will wait up to 18 times longer waiting for hot water today than you did in 1970. All right. So for some homeowners, it's a light switch. All right. It was a big change that said, you know, that old house that we had, that 1500 square foot house, our starter home, you know, we didn't have to wait for hot water. Now we moved into this bigger home at 3000 square feet and I have to wait for hot water. And what do they do about it? What do a lot of homeowners do? when they realize they have to wait for hot water. It's interesting. It's interesting when you think about the psyche. Uh, and these are things that I think about because I travel the East Coast uh, and I spend a lot of time tra uh, thinking to myself. Um, some thoughts are interesting. Some are just scary and I'm not gonna share those with you. You know, you spend a few hours by yourself in the car each week uh, driving all over the place. But what do most homeowners do? Um, they kind of complain, but to themselves and don't do anything about it. All right, they don't know that there are fixes for it. So, right, so so Farshad was saying, open the hot water and let it run for 10 minutes before you get in the shower, right? Go do something else. All right, turn the water on and walk away, as Bob says, yes. You know, so, but they don't complain about it because they don't know there's a fix out there. All right, most people don't know there's a way to correct it. So you just end up waiting for it. All right, now, if you wanna think about that wait, the average family of four will waste 32 gallons a day waiting for hot water. 32 gallons a day waiting for hot water. Because we just turn it on. Yeah. And then also, uh, Eric, uh, they think the water heater is broken. Or the other half of the story is, you know, they put that new water heater in and they put that nice new wall hung style in. What was the nickname of those years ago that got all of a sudden everybody's attention real fast and they said, Oh, it's instantaneous. Well, no, it's instantaneous in making hot water, but still downstairs. All right, doesn't mean it's instantaneous at the fixer itself. Okay, uh, Andrew, we will get to that real quick. So think about 32 gallons of water a day waiting for hot water. All right, 
that equates to a 12,000 gallons a year. 12,000 gallons waiting for hot water. All right, so 12,000 gallons is the equivalence of a 10 by 20 pool, eight foot deep. All right, and I know this isn't 10 by 20, but I thought it was a cool picture uh, on these container style pools that are people are doing nowadays. Um, so this this pool was around 9,800 gallons. All right, on a on a uh, 20 foot container. All right, now think about that for a second. All right, we see containers on the road all the time. We're seeing trucks all all over the place. Um, and uh, just think of those trucks that go by filled with water. And that's what the average family of four will waste. All right, probably just more than that. So, um, oh, I didn't do this. I, I didn't do this job, Andrew. I just saw it online. I thought it was a pretty cool shot. All right, when I started looking up what, what a, a 12,000 gallon pool and this showed up, I had to use it. So, um, but that would be a pr pretty cool swim for the day, huh? So, that's interesting. 12,000 gallons. Now, uh, at the same point, what does the average family of four use for water per year? And if you're a family of four, just think about that. What do you use for water? Or do you even know how much water you use if you are a family of four? All right. So, and I remember when I learned this 12,000 gallons per year about eight years ago, and uh, as I'm driving home from Rhode Island, we just had this big meeting and we were talking about DHW uh, research and I was creating some new presentations and, and I learned this 12,000 gallons and I get on the phone with my wife and I said, honey, I, I need you to do me a favor if you can. Grab me the water bills for the last year. And she says, well, well why? What's going on? And I'm like, oh, I just need to take a look at them. And my wife, because I travel so much, I'm on the road all the time that she handles all the house things. And she thought maybe there was a problem that I got an email or a phone call. And I said, no, no, I just need to take a look at it for work. And she's like, oh, okay. Because she knows I'm a freak like that when it comes to work things. So, um, and, and I see a couple of comments coming in on, you know, how many gallons of water most people use per year. And most people don't even know. Most people don't know how much they use. Why? Because when the bill comes in, it's usually such a low bill that you just pay it and right the, and the end it sometimes it comes in different for uh, different forms so you don't know how to convert that number over all right so you just bypass it it's a low number you pay it and you make it go away usually your water bill is a is a low bill in your house so um when i got home i calculated my usage as a family of four and i came in at around 118,000 gallons and we weren't wasteful. Yes, I had two little kids and bath time and stuff like that. Um, um, so, but it was 118. All right. So if I would have saved 12,000 gallons a year, I'd be saving about 10% of my bill. All right. So 10% uh, would be saved. And that equated to about $30 a year. All right. Just in the water bill itself. So uh, yes, I did water the lawn, so I did have a little bit of a spike in there, uh, and I had a small postage stamp, you know, it was less than a, a quarter acre uh, that I lived on. So yes, we did have that little bit of a spike in the middle there, but if, still, if I knocked out that 12,000 gallons, um, you know, there's not a huge amount, not a huge amount, okay? Now, let's start thinking about other variables, all right? So if you look at that, you know, 2,000 square foot home, all right? Um, as the house gets bigger, the larger the waste because we have a lot more run of water throughout the house itself. So you got larger pipe, like I said, longer run. So the larger the house, the larger the waste. So yeah, that 10% may not seem like a big deal or that 12,000 gallons or that one pool may not be that big of a deal, but just think about your immediate neighbors, just those 10 immediate neighbors around you. All right. Also doing the exact same thing, because if they have the same construction as you do, that's now 120,000 gallons. And those are the 10 homes that you can see from your front door. Then all of a sudden you start thinking about the entire neighborhood. All right. And if you're a neighborhood of 100 homes, it's 1.2 million gallons of water wasted. All right. Per year while waiting for hot water when it's a very simple thing that can be corrected. All right. So it starts to compound rather quickly in that extra water that's being used. Now, for me on Long Island, where I live, 
uh, we all have cesspools, all right, for most of us anyway. Um, so when I pay for a water bill, I only have to pay for water coming in. Now, if you have to, uh, now if you, you start going in further uh, west of me on Long Island and you start getting into Brooklyn and Queens, um, now you have to pay the water coming in, but you also have to pay for the water going out and the sewage costs. And your sewage costs can be twice as much on what the water is coming in. So yes, I was looking at about $30 a year, but now you start looking at research giving you around $100 a year in savings. All right, so, uh, so very interesting when you start thinking about it. And then when you start to compound it and multiply it as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger across the country, okay? <clears throat> And then of course there's the waiting. All right. So yes, there's the, the 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 green side of us all that we never really want to waste water. Okay. But now just imagine eliminating the weight. Okay. And of course I have research in my home and and I and I travel a lot, so I do spend a lot of time in hotels. Some hotels have them and some hotels don't. And there are times when I get into that shower in the hotel. Um forgetting to check and I turn it on and all of a sudden bang you're up against the wall <laughs> right with that cold water coming out of there because it wakes you up pretty hard pretty quickly in the morning when you're not paying attention to that so it's very interesting um when you start thinking about you know your normal procedures you know if you don't have research in your home and you travel and you get to a hotel you turn the water on and you put your hand in and test it I forget to do that nowadays because I'm so used to having research here in my home uh, and then not having to wait for it. So, uh, and then, you know, so yes, there's the green side of it, but then there's the comfort and convenience of never having to wait for it again. So, and, and, and it's interesting because a lot of people will not offer it to customers. All right. They're like, ah, it's too expensive. Never, never assume, you know, what is a customer's pain point? Um, because that waiting could be tremendous to them and it's something that they need to plan for in the day to get their day going. Um, so if you want to add research, all right, let's take a look at the plumbing that we had before. So for example, we had that T and branch style system and we ended at that furthest fixture out there in the house. The ideal way to add recirculation would be to tap in at the furthest point away and run a return line back to the water heater. We put a circulator on it and we'll control it later. Um, and therefore we have created, so to speak, a closed loop system where we're going to trickle hot water around this pipe. So when the, you know, the water cools, it never really cools down in the pipe. It's already available to us whenever we take a draw on every fixture. Now we take a look at this and you might say right away, and I know uh, a comment came in through before, well, you know, this fixture that's the furthest away, that's the worst offender. All right, that's the one we have to wait for the water the most. And unfortunately, it's up on the second floor, so I'm gonna have to bust open sheetrock and, and try to run this return line all the way back. I just can't do it. I just can't get there to do that. So we can't add research. Well, I want you to stop and think about this for a second. As we designed this plumbing system and installed it, right, we usually start at the water heater itself and what pipe size did we come off that water heater with, right? That was our larger pipe size. So we're looking at that one inch or inch and a quarter coming off of here now. And then as we start hitting our taps coming off, hitting the different fixtures, we can start necking the pipe down. My point of this is to say is it's not necessarily the distance that's the issue. It's the volume of water in the first 60, 70% that we need to concern ourselves with. So just because you can't get to the second floor to that furthest fixture doesn't mean you can't add research. What if we were to add a tap into here, a T in, and run this back? So maybe before that pipe went upstairs to the second floor where we can still see it in the basement space, we run a T in and then we run the return line back. And now what we can do is make sure we charge, say, this part of the system. And this little part is what is fed upstairs. Now. There's a number that I have in my head, and it was from my previous life in working with PEX. That half inch PEX, six and a half feet long, is basically about my wingspan here, you know, a little bit more than that. All right. Six and a half feet long holds a cup of water. Holds a cup of water. So if you think about that, when you turn on a faucet, by the time you get your hands underneath it, 
a cup of water's already gone down the drain. So if this length of pipe was six and a half feet, you're good to go. Let's double it. Let's call it 12 feet of pipe. All right. And we might be running half inch to that last fixture in the house. Two cups of water went down rather than having to dump all of this. And as we'll see in two weeks when we go through the design, we'll see how much water is in that pipe when we start going through the design phase. So it you don't have to get to the further section. Get to the way the pipe, uh, largest pipe ends, and then we break down into the smallest pipe, uh, feeding those last couple of fixtures and run that return line. So lots and lots of options to adding recirc in there. And I've run into where, hey, we just can't do it. We can't get there. I'm not busting open sheetrock to do that. And I agree. I wouldn't want to either. All right. But also think about this. Sheetrock's cheap. Yeah, I know. We got to paint it and spackle it and stuff like that. Um, but what is the pain point for the customer itself? So I let them understand um, the repercussions one way or the other. So can easily do it. Now, version two. All right. When we start looking at hot water recirc is again. Now, uh, like I said before, as we. We want to retrofit it in there. Now, we do have a retrofit application where we are not going to run a new return line, but we're going to use the cold water supply as the return line to send it back into the water heater. And we have to add two devices. One, we need to add our circulator. And two, we add what we call our hot link valve or a crossover valve. So the circulator is going to go on the hot water supply uh, pumping out away from the water heater itself. And we use this crossover valve, all right, uh, what we call a hot link valve to transfer a small amount of water across and then return it back in. So uh, that is our second way to add it, especially in the retrofit application when you can't run uh, that re dedicated return line like I showed you before any way possible because we have a lot of sheetrock uh, already completed throughout the whole house. So what the hot link bypass valve does, all right, is it will open and close to allow a very, very small amount of water to pass through. So if I come back a second, I want to show this here. Um, it's not that we're pumping hot water through the valve, right? We're looking at room temperature. So room temperature water in the hot pipe, all right, hot water line is going to be 70 degrees. At the same time, what's the water temperature in the cold side? I need to grab this real quick. So what's the water temperature in the cold water line? Well, 55 if we draw off of it, right? But it's going to be room temperature. So it's, yes, it's also going to be 70 degrees, right? So all we're doing and what this valve's design, what it's going to do is take room temperature water here and move it over to the cold side and put room temperature water there that was already there and then put it back into the water heater to get heated back up again. Now, it would be 55 degrees, yes, if there was a draw off of it, right? Or whatever whatever temperature it is you're getting from the street itself. But typically, if you haven't used water in the house in quite a while, both pipes have cooled down to room temperature or warmed up to room temperature, right? So the way this device works um, is that you're going to uh, pull the hoses that are going to your fixture, we're going to tie them into the left and right hand side, as you can see, hot and cold, and then hot cold across the top here goes back up to your fixtures. So on the left and the right is coming from the valves out of the wall, and from the top side is going back up to the fixtures there. Okay. Um, and what this device does is allows a small amount of water as it cools down on the hot side to pass through, all right, and go on the cold side of things. Once the water gets warm, all right, on the hot side, it will shut the valve off to prevent that water from passing through. So we don't get warm water on the cold pipe. All right, so we want to make sure that warm water stays here and we don't transfer too much energy over to the right hand side to the cold pipes um, and make sure that water stays cold. Um, question comes in from Max and says, would you need a backflow preventer of some type then on the cold water main? Yes, that's already there. Right, that would already be coming in from the street, so you already have that there. That is correct. Um, there are also check valves that we need to place in our system. So a, a backflow or a simple swing check or spring check valve uh, can also be added if you don't have a backflow on there. 
Um, now, I don't have the details on those piping diagrams, but with the equipment, the parts and pieces, and our instruction sheets, we do show those check valves there. Uh, another question came, comes in from Andrew. Do you need to install some balancing valves on the cold water if you do this system? Um, no, you wouldn't have to because it's a very small trickle that goes through here. Now, the other thing that I want to add about the hot link valve is that this device is designed for tank style water heater. All right, it's a very low flow. We're looking at about 0.3 gallons a minute flowing through here. So we don't need to add any balancing valves uh, in the system itself. Okay, uh, so it's very low flow and it's designed for tank style. For tankless style, we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, um, do you have a pressure loss going through the 006? There is some, not large. All right, not going to be, and you're going to have a large fitting uh, of pipes coming out uh, connected to it, depending on what the line size is here. So we have a very low pressure drop going through the, the through the circulator itself. <clears throat> All right, so what's going on inside? Well, it has a this the hot link valve is a non-electric device. All right, so there is no electricity, there's no batteries, there's no valve, so to speak, that's opening and closing. It's a sensor disc. It's actually like a snap disc. Um, and here you can see a, 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 a picture of it. It's a stainless steel snap disc in here, and it's a cartridge design. So it will close when the warm water reaches it, so and preventing that warm water from passing through. And you can obviously take this apart and clean it because we all don't live in Maine near Poland Spring. So uh, there is a screen on here, so you can take it apart, clean this, and get it back up and running again. Um, uh, to, to make sure that we're not having any issues with the unit itself. So how's it work on the inside? All right, so the first thing I wanted to point out is this thermal disc. It's a snap disc. Uh, it's two pieces of stainless steel that are bonded together that are temperature sensitive, and each piece of stainless has a different temperature sensitivity. So, and snap disc meaning it's convex or concave. And when the water is cold on that one side, it will snap down to allow the water to flow through. And it's a very low flow. You can see these little holes that are through here that allow that very low water flow to come through. And once the water starts to warm up on that one side, it will snap upwards to prevent any more water from flowing through. Okay. Um, so very low flow, like I said before, we have a check valve in here to prevent cold water from migrating through to the hot side, obviously. So we don't want when you open up the, uh, the fixture, on the hot side, we don't want cold water to flow through that way, so we have that check valve preventing it. Um, but the circulator will, it has enough power to push this little check valve open to allow that trickle of, say, 0.3 gallons a minute through it. All right, and like I said, here's your cartridge design uh, where you can pull this out and replace. So I forgot, I got one here. Uh, I like to put, uh, point it out for you. A couple of things I like to point out with this cartridge, with the whole thing. So one, let me show you the cartridge. All right, so here's your, if you take a look in the camera, I'll try to make sure it gets focused and not on my mug and it's having a hard time. But I want to point out that it has a hexagonal shape on here. That is used for a wrench to take it apart. I do not want you to use a wrench to put this thing back together. We want to put this back together hand tight. So we do have an O-ring seal, one here and another O-ring seal here. So when this goes back together, you just tighten this down by hand till it hits the bottom. You do not need to put a wrench on here, all right? Because if you tighten this down too much, all right, we're going to compress a little bit of stuff inside of here and you may get some fluttering, all right? So if you hear any chattering or fluttering of the valve itself, you want to be able to um, not tighten that down. So just hand tight is what you're looking to do. <clears throat> um. All right, so that's how the, the basic uh, uh, question comes in from Travis. Uh, would you recommend putting hot link on all sinks in the house? Well, the, the the design is technically, if you have a main trunk and branch style system, you just need it on the furthest fixture because all the other fixtures in front of it will get the flow, all right? So you don't want to just put it on the closest one because then the one's furthest because then it'll just bypass all those others, right? So you want to get it to run around the entire house. So the design calls for the furthest one away. And I got some pictures for that too, right? So that's a perfect lead in Travis. Uh, as we look at, you know, that furthest fixture, like I was showing you before, we can go and put up to six valves per circulator uh, in our house. So 
you can go up to six. I look at it as critical functions, all right? Uh, meaning or critical areas of the house. What are the two most critical areas of the house to have domestic hot water at? Think about that fixture and install, all right? And which ones, where would you put them? What do you, what do you all consider the critical fixtures in a house? Which ones are the most critical that you wanna make sure you got hot water at, all right? Kitchen sink and shower, master, right? You wanna make sure the master bath gets it and the kitchen sink. Don't worry about the guests or the kids, who cares about them? <laughs> but I usually try to get those two areas of the house most important. Um, so with the multiple valves, yes, look at the critical areas, but also in, a, in some plumbing nowadays, you might have that water heater in the center of the house and we tee off in two directions. So furthest one down here, furthest one down there, or any others that you deem uh, required to put it in there. So that's where I would do it. Um, but remembering up to about six per house, usually I do two, all right? My house, I put one in, I got it in the, because I know how it was plumbed. Uh, why the limit of six? Because of the flow and the head loss and everything like that. So, and the other half of why six is because we didn't never tested anything more than that um, in a residential setting. If you had more than six bathrooms in a house, that's a lot in one house uh, with the hot link valve. So, <clears throat> all right, so now as we start thinking about adding the system in, we have the circulator, we have either the dedicated return line or using the hot link valve, how do you control the circulator? How is the circulator controlled? What do we do with that thing, turning it on and off all the time, all right? Uh, do we turn it on and off? Do we leave it on 24 hours a day? In your experience that's out there, what have you guys done? And ladies, okay. Um, you know, when you've put hot water research in, what do we do? Well, one, yeah, always on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all right, is, is running all the time. <clears throat> um, what does it cost to run a 006 24-7 and the cost of additional uh, through hot water pipe, right? So, you know, well, you could take, the, it depends on the electrical costs. So it's a, a 006 is a 40 watt circulator, I'm sorry, 60 watt circulator, all right, running at 24 hours a day and, you know, uh, the your kilowatt hours per, you know, what do you pay per kilowatt? So it could definitely add up over the course of a year at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? So yes, that happens quite often. Um, we could throw an Aquastat on it. All right, which means, you know, it's a temperature senses, uh, sensing and it says, all right, once it gets warm on the pipe and it's usually on the return pipe, we turn the pump off, all right? So it takes, it does run the circulator a lot less time by doing that uh, because it's, hey, but obviously a lot of times we do, we put that Aquastat on the return pipe that's back at the water heater itself. So all that pipe all the way out, uh, where we need to make sure we're moving the water through too, right? Uh, correct, Travis. It's always 60 watt. All right. Circulator, uh, uh, a standard 006 is not going to be a variable speed circulator. It's going to run 60 watts all day. Okay. Now, if you had the 006 E3, which we'll talk about in detail in, in two classes from now, that one's variable between four watts and 44 watts, depending on where you set it. Okay. Um, but yes, when it's running, regardless of the gallons per minute, it's going to draw 44 watts. Um, <clears throat> so yes, John saying to, to use an Aquastat, correct, exactly right. Now you can also throw timers on them, all right? And we have what we, uh, a line of circulars that we call plumb and plugs, um, that have a built-in timer right into the circulator, right onto the electrical box. And we've got two different types. You've got the daily timer, like you see here on the left-hand side, and then you have the weekly digital timer. So the daily timer, as you look at it, um, Every pin that you see here represents 15 minutes of the day, okay? And it's a 24-hour timer, so you knock down the pins and based upon what time of the day you want the circulator to run. In order to program this, it's even easier. As you notice, this kind of looks like a clock face, all right? The only thing you don't see is the three right here, and that's because you have this timer switch, all right? So you actually turn the timer, the whole thing spins to you reach the time of the day. And then that is set, and then you knock down the pins, as you can see here, for the time that's going around here on when you think you're going to use it. So it's interesting when it comes to these, either one of these, now the, the digital one, 
is good for a seven day calendar. So you can have a different calendar for during the week as you do on the weekends, but who programs them? Who sets them up? All right. Uh, in my experience right now, we start uh, putting these in and I have probably around 70% of my installers will say, well, I leave that to the homeowner. And, you know, 30% say, well, I do it. And yes, it becomes a pain in the neck because I have to come back and redo it often. Same as a programmable thermostat, right? How many people have a programmable thermostat in their home not programmed? Or do you have to program it for your customers? Very interesting when you start thinking about that, right? So yes, you can do a combination of the two, throw in the Aquastat and the timer, uh, you know, so you get kind of getting the best of both worlds on there, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then let's make it smart. Let's make that circulator smart. Now I threw up a picture of a thermostat on the wall, like the Nest thermostat. All right. And as I pulled that picture up and a bunch of people out there started to groan, you know, half the people out there groan, they say, oh, what a pain in the neck this is, especially with some of our older hydronic systems out there, because we only have two wires in the wall and it becomes a challenge. Um, but regardless of that, why is this thermostat one of the most popular in the minds of homeowners today? Why do homeowners, why do people want this type of power, this type of thermostat? Okay. Now Farshad saying it looks cool. It's got Wi-Fi connectivity, right? It's got a whole bunch of stuff with it. It connects to their phone so I can see what the heck is going on in here, right? You know? So is that true? At first, yeah. The first three months any homeowner puts in one of these Wi-Fi style thermostats, they're checking stuff out all the time on it. All right, they're seeing what the temperature is in their house and they're adjusting it and doing everything, even when they're sitting right across the hall from it and they're looking at the thermostat and say, well, I don't feel like getting up to adjust the temperature. I can do that from here. That is true for about the first three months. And then after that, maybe once a year do they log into it. And usually that once a year is when you go away on vacation and you say, oh, I forgot to set it back. You know, we're not going to be home for the next week. Let me turn the temperature down or up, depending on what time of the year it is, right? So, but the other half, the biggest reason why a lot of people love these style thermostats is because they are learning thermostats, right? So Bob nailed it before and he said, it's learning. As in, I don't want to program my programmable thermostat. These have motion sensors and will learn when I'm home and keep the temperature comfortable for when I am there and learn my schedule and always adjust my schedule as it's as 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 it's going on. Okay. So those are things to think about, right? So that thermostat going on the wall is what people are thinking about. Well, we did the same thing when it came to learning people's patterns and usage of hot water. And we have what we call the smart plug. The smart plug is going to learn when people use hot water in their home and run the circulator only for those time periods and will always adjust. All right. It's thirsty for knowledge and will change as the, the patterns go on in people's homes. OK, so now we can eliminate that always on. We can eliminate the Aquastat, the manual timer. You know, the timer, the plumbing plug, we've had that for many years. All right. And people love using them. Uh, and now, but you think about any timer, all right, it, and, and those first time installers, those first time homeowners that had a hot water research system installed in their home, they put the plumbing plug in there. It works great. And then all of a sudden contractor gets a phone call and says, it's not working anymore. I had to wait for hot water this morning. I think something's wrong. Can you come over and take a look at it? So if you come over and take a look at it and you notice that, oh, the timer's incorrect or well, what happened? Oh, we had a storm yesterday and we had a power outage. Well, the timer doesn't keep up. It doesn't know that. So now it's off by whatever time period you lost power for. And also twice a year, we lose, you know, we have daylight savings. So now we got to adjust that timer again. Um, so when we go back and take a look at that timer, all right, on the, on the standard 24 hour timer, all right, this switch here is an on, off or timer and you flick it to the on position and bypass the timer altogether so we don't ever have to worry about it again, okay? 
Uh, Lauren says, well, if we're using hot water, why do we need the pump? Well, we haven't been using it for a while. Now we want the pump to learn when we turn it on. So you don't have that 10 minutes of standing there. All right. So if it's always being used, different story. All right. So, um, but in a residential setting, we use water at certain time periods. It's usually that, you know, first shower of the day that are getting, if you have a couple of people that jump in back to back to back, all right, that's a different story. Uh, but as first one has to wait for it, right? So the smart plug, very simple. All right. We, if you can't wire this, all right, I, I want you to consider a new trade. <laughs> all right you get a circulator with the plug on it plug this into the outlet plug the plump into there uh there is a temperature sensor that we are going to strap onto the hot water supply pipe itself and what it does is it learns events um and, and it will learn those events on when there was a hot water draw okay so for example let's take a look at how settings you know your, your usage of water during the day and it has a seven day calendar built in and 24 hours in that day. Okay. Um, so as we look at, uh, I'm not going to do the full 24 hours in here. And let's say we got Monday and Tuesday, we have the exact same calendar, right? So at around 7 a.m., that first Monday, water was used, a shower was taken. And so that has been recorded as an event at seven. Now, what the cert, what the smart plug is going to do is say, we had an event and an event is a temperature rise in the pipe, a duration at that pipe temperature, and then a temperature fall. So there was water used at 7 a.m. So what it does is it says, all right, I'm gonna turn the circulator on, not exactly at seven o'clock. I'm gonna turn it on a little bit before and I'm gonna let it run a little bit after to give you a window of opportunity to get in the shower because we don't always exactly get in at the exact same time every day, right? So we're giving you a wide window of opportunity, could be up to an hour, all right? All right, now that we don't have any usage, the temperature drop, you know, the temperature in the pipe drops, there's no more usage. So now we let the water temperature drop in the pipe itself. And then um, there was a washer machine being used, all right? We use the washer machine around one o'clock in the afternoon. Again window of opportunity has been created, the circulator's there. So when you do get to that opportunity of using the water at one o'clock uh, in the afternoon, it is already warm in the pipe. We don't have to waste anything. All right, then it cools down. And then we've got baths for the kids. All right, uh, that might've been back-to-back -back baths, a little bit longer. And then as nighttime approach approaches, then it stays off for the entire night. Now, what this is doing is learning that seven day calendar. So if we jump in on Wednesday, Wednesday, there is no laundry being done. It's not laundry day. So the circulator doesn't run at those points. Uh, so it stays off during the day. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so now we're not running that circulator. Now what happens here during this time period, when the circulator is on, it does not run continuously. The design of the smart plug is to run five minutes on, 10 minutes off. Five minutes on, 10 minutes off to really knock down the electrical cost too at the same time. So, because the water is not going to cool down on the pipe in that 10 minute time period, it's just going to, so we run five on, 10 off, five on, 10 off. Now that is true. What's going to happen as soon as you plug this in, the first seven days while it's in the learning mode, all right, that learn mode happens that first seven days, it is already running five on 10 off all day, all night for its first seven days. Then after the first seven days, then it goes into the schedule that it had learned. So um, so if you're sitting there staring at this and saying, how come it hasn't shut off in that first week? It's going to be, that's why, all right? So that's what we need to pay attention to. And if you lose power to the house, Unfortunately, it does wipe out the memory that you had, but it goes back to the learn mode. So homeowners are not going to know that it's back into the learning mode and then it relearns. Um, it also has a, a vacation calendar or vacation schedule built in, which means if there was no usage, there's no events for 36 hours, the plug will learn that and say, hey, nobody's home. We haven't used water in a while. We're going to shut off until somebody draws water again once you draw water again it wakes back up again and goes back into one learning and also turning the circulator back on again 
Now, if people do not have any regimen, like most of us over the last two years, three years or so, where we were stuck home and water usage was whenever you had a chance to jump in the shower. So, or you have a, a an apartment building, small apartment building, you know, now this can handle up a six amp circulator. So you can do some big pumps off of this. So there is a button on the bottom here, your mode button, all right, right here. And if you change it, you change it into the pulse mode, which means don't learn but pulse, five on, 10 off, five on, 10 off, all day, all night, okay? So, uh, and this can be used on either system, whether we talk about the hot link design or the dedicated return uh, pipe design. So either way you can do this with uh, in that application. So uh, let's see a couple of comments that came in here. Smart plug and improvement, what do we have? A pump capable of inch and a quarter flow rate, then only need 0.3. Uh, well, that would be be based on the hot link design, right? So when you have that circulator, we, inch and a quarter pipe is designed for when the fixtures flow, all right? When we get down to recirc, we don't need the entire flow of the fixture. We just need to move temperature. So remember the definition from the beginning. We're not moving serious gallons. We just need to move temperature. We don't want that water to cool down. So this can be a very, very low flow does not have to be a large design flow. And we'll see that design when we get to it next week, okay? Uh, with a tankless water heater and a smart plug is the pulse mode, uh, will the heater be firing correct? Um, that will depend upon the tankless water heaters themselves and, and seeing if a five minute run is a long enough time for it uh, to register. And it should be, right? Um, because, you know, so should be okay. Uh, how many sensors does the smart plug want? Uh, just one. Just one temperature sensor comes off. It comes with it. It has a 10-foot lead. Molex plug right into the bottom here. So just plug that in. Unfortunately, I think mine is out in my truck in a bin somewhere. So I, I misplaced the sensor uh, probably at the last training class. So uh, just strap it. And my goal, when you strap that sensor on, I like it as far down the supply pipe as you can. Uh, you don't want to put it right next to the water heater itself. Uh, because you will get that stacking in the water heater and the temperature changes in the pipe right there in the beginning portion of it. So it might think you're always drawing water off of it. Um, if you have a mixing valve, you just want to go right after the mix valve. I want it to be on the supply side. Robert asked uh, a supplier return. I want it on the supply so it knows what the water usage temperature is and it sees that temperature change. Um, if you put a, a heat trap in, perfect, but do it after the heat trap itself. So um, but not next to the water heater. If you can use all 10 feet of the wire, even better, because then we'll get a better reading of what's actually going on in the system itself, okay? <clears throat> awesome. Keep the questions coming. Keep the questions coming. <clears throat> um, Robert asks, how does the smart plug know when the hot water is being used versus just the, heat, just the pump heating the pipe? Well, the pump's not running. Right. So the circulator is not on at the time. So and, you know, with the smaller circulators that we have, they're not adding as much heat to the system itself. And again, five minutes on 10 off is not adding a lot of heat to it. Um, so it's not looking for actual temperature. It looks for a temperature rise, a duration at that temperature and then a temperature fall. So there are no actual numbers to the temperature the smart plug is learning. It's just looking for a temperature change and then a duration at that temperature and then a fall. Okay. <clears throat> Excellent. Okay. Have you installed a hot link valve without a circ? Friend of mine did and says gets hot water quicker. Yes, I have seen projects where the hot link uh, valves have been installed without a circulator. Um, and that's basically the, the way the old timers used to do it, right? Gravity, gravity recirculation and gravity recirc you got to make sure of a couple of things, right? We don't have any downward pitches in the pipe. They should all be upward pitch, all right? If you have any downward pitch, you're not going to get that hot water to rise in the pipe itself. So I have seen uh, gravity recirc work with hot link valves before. So just putting the valve in without a circulator has worked. Now what you have is uncontrolled uh, recirculation, right? So if you put the circulator in and, you know, one thing's about gravity, circula uh, gravity recirculation, is one, you have no control over it. Two, your hot water supply pipe becomes a constant radiator, right? It's always hot and always radiating heat and always losing heat too. So you need to replenish that, right? So you always have that water coming out of that water heater itself to reheat up again. 
um, and you could be adding heat to a house, especially in the summertime. You know, all these little things start to add up. Um, but when we put a circulator in and we have check valves in, you won't get that hot water rising in the pipe. You'll only get the hot water in the pipe when you need it. So that is the difference between a gravity style system and a forced circulation style system. <clears throat> uh you said next week you mean two weeks from now correct uh that's correct right sorry travis yes next week uh, uh not next week next next residential focus class we'll get into the uh the design side of things correct um so robert says so if bath time changes from 3 p.m daily to another time how does the smart plug sense the water isn't being used well it won't see that event change so um for example if i didn't use the water here in the middle all right it has learned that wednesday it doesn't run now if one wednesday i do use it and then all of a sudden you don't use it it will erase an event so yes it would have turned on uh here in the middle if if a wednesday sometime in the you know a week ago uh that the bath was used in the middle of the day or water usage was used here in the middle of the day it would have run today and turned on and then turned off again and if nobody drew from it then it would have deleted it okay um <clears throat> so that's what happened so yes it would run but then it would end up deleting it from your schedule too okay excellent 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 all right now what about tankless i'm, I'm running a little over here to talk about tankless so um tankless we have another product out there that we call the Taco genie now the Taco genie is a system that uh instead of this instead of the hot link valve going underneath the sink we're looking at doing a circulator underneath the sink um and underneath this and and this circulator now is designed to move the water fast and furious all right and a high flow rate because your tankless water heaters are typically looking for at least a half a gallon a minute or more in order to fire and like i said these things these crossover style valves don't reach that minimum flow rate in order to get the water heater to fire so and the Taco genie is probably the greenest system that we have as in it uses the least amount of electricity and runs the shortest amount of time because it runs when the homeowner wants it to run the homeowner makes this thing click on and it is run by either a push button as in there's a, a button that will press and says turns the pump on or a motion sensor i prefer the motion sensor option because you don't have to remember to press the button so you put the motion sensor into the bathroom pump turns on and then gets the hot water up to your fixtures rather quickly if you walk into a bathroom and the motion sensor trips if you walk into a bathroom there's probably a high chance someone's going to need hot water in a couple of seconds or so all right meaning we're going to take a shower or a wash of the hands or something like that at least you hope so right so uh so we can do this back at the water heater uh, but in the retrofit application, we're going to put this underneath the sink and try to get it at the furthest fixture in the house itself. Um, and like I said, this is designed for use with tankless water heaters because our tankless water heaters also have a very high pressure drop going through their heat exchangers. So we are typically looking at a higher head circulator like our 008 or 0011 circulators that the Taco Genie is designed for. So it can be used with tank style also. All right. But if you were to use it for tankless, here's our basically trunk and branch we put that circulator at the furthest portion uh, uh, underneath the sink um problem is the outlet underneath the sink i agree i agree but we typically have an outlet just above the wall uh just above the sink counter so we can pigtail off and maybe get that outlet underneath if the if the kitchen sink isn't the first fixture in the loop consider the kitchen area too okay um and so we'll put this at the furthest fixture. So again, uh, whether it's a tank style or tankless, uh, we put this fixture underneath the sink. And, and if we're doing it back at the water heater itself, if you do have that dedicated return line, you can do that here too, and still use the motion sensors um, or the button switch to activate. But one of the things I wanna talk about how this works, how the hot link, I mean, how the Genie works, I'm sorry. Uh, the Genie has a, some, uh, a, a temperature sensor built in. All right, and the temperature sensor is built in right at the supply side. And what it does is not look for temperature, but it looks for a temperature rise from when it was activated. So when the motion sensor gets tripped, the first thing it says is, all right, what's the temperature at the sensor? 
if the sensor is below 99 degrees, it says, okay, we can turn on. The pump kicks on, and what it's looking to do is an eight degree rise. It's not looking for actual temperature, it's looking for an eight degree rise on when it was turned on. So, and remember, water moves like a slug in the pipe, not like a snail, all right? Slug as in right here, all right, we're looking at room temperature water, right behind it is going to be your say 120 so as the 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 room temperature 70 degree water is being chased by the 120 going throughout the house all right and so as soon as it sees an eight degree rise right at the circulator the pump shuts off the design of here is the circulator runs anywhere between 15 and 45 seconds depending upon the length of run of pipe that we have here um so eight you know uh, 15 to 45 seconds the pump runs shuts off all right and that's what i mean by the greenest system that we have that it keeps that circulator off it only runs when you need it so if you were to walk out of the bathroom and then turn around and walk back in two things keep the circulator off one remember it looked at the sensor first and said oh what's the temperature at the sensor oh above 100 all right i don't need to over 99 degrees i don't need to run Two, the motion sensor has a four minute lockout. All right, so if, if you walk in and then out again, come back, all right, if it's under that four minutes, it won't even look at the temperature sensor down here. It says, yeah, uh, we're within that four minute uh, rule here. But after that four minutes, if it's still hot here, pump stays off, all right, pump stays off. And then if you're doing it with a dedicated return line, Again, you can do the, the, the pump back at the water heater itself so you don't take up that valuable real estate underneath the master bath sink. All right, and then you can put the motion sensors. Now you can do as many motion sensors as you like throughout the house. So you can put one in each bathroom of the house and the pump turns on and it circulates the entire house. So it just doesn't have to have the furthest fixture. You can also have another motion sensor down here as we show by remote activation, whether it's a button switch, uh, we have the wireless remotes, or you can go with another motion sensor there. So, um, and you can get the same activation throughout the entire house. So every fixture in the house will get that use of hot water. Excellent. Keep the questions coming in there, everybody. Greatly appreciate it. Um, we are done. All right. I know I ran a couple of minutes over, uh, at seven minutes over. Um, so, uh, next week's class, August 2nd. Yes. I can't believe I'm saying the words August already. All right, July is just about done. Uh, uh, the commercial guys, Rich and Brett, are going over an introduction to hydraulic separators. So, uh, so take a look at that one if you haven't signed up already. If not, you will get an email in 23 hours time uh, with a link of today's class and a link to register for next week's class. Um, also, let's see here. Can you combine a genie with the doorbell buttons pumped by the water heater and a hot link valve? Um, the hot link valve no no i wouldn't use the hot link valve and a genie um i mean uh and and the genie correct um oh at each end of the house on one side so you need i would say you want a separate pump for your uh for your hot link so if you had water heater in the center if i'm i'm, if I'm thinking about you lauren water heater in the center one side of the house you're going to get the genie the other side of the house is going to do hot link i would put a separate circulator on the hot link side of things uh wouldn't use the same circulator for both um so i guess you could put a hot link valve you'll get some flow but it's always going to take the path of least resistance what you're looking at <clears throat> um all right another side note take away the dark summer edition summer has escaped us uh travis uh, so it's been a challenge for John and I to uh, to get together to do some takeaway after darks and just really put together the, ske uh, the schedule. So uh, it looks like takeaway after dark is going to uh, start back up again with our factory sessions in September, October, sometime. Um, so we haven't uh, we haven't finalized that. We got to get together and work on that. So, all righty, everybody, I will sit here and ramble on for the next uh, 30 seconds or so as I start seeing some questions or, or the lack of questions coming in. I do want to say thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It was greatly appreciated. I love that we still get tons and tons of you people out there joining us for our Takeo Tuesday sessions. We have fun doing them. Um, I think you people out there joining us also have a little bit of fun and learn something, too, at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so um do greatly appreciate you guys coming in and hanging out and we're going to keep doing them 
we're going to keep doing them. Yes, as we are coming back to live training classes, um, the, the the webinars are still going strong. So yes, takeaway after dark uh, factory classes will start up in the fall. Takeo Tuesdays are continuing um, as we start doing the live classes. If you're looking forward to uh, getting to a live class with myself, Rick, or John, uh, we do have the factory classes in September and October still. Uh, we still have spots available. We have uh, uh, re uh, remote training classes going on. So check with your local representatives, uh, check with uh, your commercial salespeople, and uh, we can always come to your neck of the woods also. Um, how to handle tankless coil in the burner itself. You mean like one is in the boiler? Yeah, those are challenges, buddy. Those are challenges, definitely. Uh, I have had a little bit of success. Uh, some people put in uh, little buffer tanks, so to speak, or storage tanks to work with that, Stephen, um, <clears throat> and trying to get them going. So, uh, Travis, you're welcome. Farshad, thank you. Uh, greatly appreciated. Charles said thank you. All right, Emma and Kerry, great to see you all. Have a great rest of your day and, of course, the great rest of your week. Enjoy all. Have a great one.